collection of, of individuals or churches that we can help uh, personally. And so uh, stay tuned for that because our hearts do go out for all the people down there. It was uh, an historic flood, not just a 100-year flood or a 500-year. And they're going to be uh, suffering in many ways for uh, many, many many, many weeks ahead. So stay tuned, and those that want to help uh, financially, uh, we'll try to get you the information that you can do so. You know, it's events like that that hopefully causes people that have never considered the important questions of life to stop when everything's been taken from them and just ask the question, what's really important in life? And we think, well, that's a good question to ask, but sometimes people do not take time to dwell on that and come to a reasonable answer. And perhaps it's when you've lost your home, you've lost all your belongings, and all you have to do, uh, have to take with you when you escape is just a bag of things you can take in a boat as they uh, uh, carry you away, and then you're placed in some shelter and you have to live there for perhaps weeks. Maybe at those times when you've lost everything and all the foundations of security have collapsed around you and there's now not even water or power and there are shortages of gas and even food, maybe it is these times that some people will finally for the first time ask, why am I here? Where am I going? What's really important in life? And hopefully it's these times they ask questions such, do I know there is a God and is he there and does he care about me? It's those kind of questions that help us build our life on firm foundations when we come to the proper answers. We're living in a society where our foundations that have held us true and strong are steadily collapsing and eroding away. And we live in a generation where there's turmoil and confusion There is no absolute truth. That which used to be right is now wrong, and that which was always wrong is now right. And people don't know what to stand upon. And that's why we've entered this discussion of things you can know absolutely. Because it's only when we have firm foundations can we stand up and be secure, and we can have peace in our life, and we can have direction. And so we've entered this discussion knowing that you, uh, you can surely know there's a God. Because it all starts with him. Because either God exists or he does not. Either he is the God and the Father and creator of all things that was just read for us, or he's not. So we ha- it's a fair to ask this question. And we want to ask again, can you know assuredly, without any doubt, not just wishful thinking, there is a God. And of course, our answer is absolutely yes. You can know. And so you ask, well, how do I know that God exists? What kind of information is there? So we're reminded of Paul's message to the Romans in chapter 1, where he writes about how God has revealed himself to each and every one of us. And when you look at this, it uh, uh, rests as our proposition of how we're uh, conducting these lessons. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within us, or them. For God has made it evident. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature has clearly been seen, being understood through what has been made, so they're without excuse. The whole proposition is that God has given evidence You can know there's a God. All you have to do is look around us. And that's why we, at one hand, appeal to science as our evidence. But yet, uh, Josiah, I don't know, is he here today? Uh, He asked a good question. Why would you appeal to science after you dismiss science? And I think that's a great question. Because there is science that studies the order of this world then there's a philosophy of science that already pre-concludes certain things which they have not come to any evidence that points to, such as there is no God. The supernatural is not possible. And uh, there's a natural explanation for everything. And so because they have a preconceived notion, they've closed their mind to evidence before them. And so we call these strong atheists or materialists, 
But when you look at just pure science, things that we know for sure without making speculative conclusions about them, it gives us the evidence from them what we desire to know there is a God. And so we've already looked at the idea of uh, the cosmological approach because we know the heavens, the Bible declares, is telling of the glory of God. So if we look up, we're going to see God exist. And even if we look inward to the smallest of the cell, we're going to learn the same lesson. God exists. And so when we're all said and done, we're not without witness. God's given us a witness to know that he's there. Because isn't that what Paul argued? That through nature, he is clearly seen. We can understand there is a God and everybody's without excuse. And so we ask the very first question, the cosmological argument. Where did everything come from? Because we know when you look at anything on this earth, it had to have a beginning. A tree came from a seed, and we know a child had to come from the womb somewhere. It didn't just pop into existence. So the same thing is true when you look at the universe. You have to ask the question, if something exists, it had to have a beginning. And so last week, I encourage you to look at, listen to the video and watch it online. We explored the idea and showed that, that it's, very, it's only reasonable to conclude that a non-physical force created the heavens and the earth. And we call that non-physical being God. And of course, that's how the Bible opens up. In the beginning, that's before there's time, that's before there's dimension, that's before there's any energy or matter. In the beginning, God, this all-knowing, omnipotent being, created. He is the force. He is the intelligence. He created time, and he also created the heavens. That's dimension, and he also created earth. That's matter. All that we see came from a source outside the physical realm. Now, let me just pause, and I want you to consider this. If that is true, which we maintain... And it's reasonable from science to make that argument. Should you not see evidence of God, his design, his creation in this world around us? Currently, today. Now, that's what we want to do. If this proposition is true, that God created it all, you should be able to see his design, his intelligence in things around us. And this is where it's fun to me. We could spend the next five hours, five days, five weeks just looking example after example after example. There's God. There's God. There's God. He's left his fingerprint everywhere if we have eyes willing to open up to see it. And so that's why we're now going to look at the teleological argument and we'll follow Lord willing with the anthropic principle. And this lesson was going to be one and now it's four. Okay? Because... It's so important. It all starts with God, doesn't it? And if, if we dismiss him, we're left without a foundation. We're just drifting as a boat on the open sea. But if God is true and he's spoken to us, and we'll get to that one next, we know we'll have a firm foundation. Now, we've showed this building many times. And again, because it illustrates the point. You know, when you look at a building, that someone built it. It didn't just exists forever, right? And it didn't just pop into existence out of nothing. That was our lesson last week. And so it shows elements of design, and so we can argue there was a designer behind it. Is that reasonable? If you can show me elements of design, lights turn on, there's doors, there's windows, there's a heating system, there's rooms, there's air conditioning. Oh, we need that this weekend, all right? You have to just conclude there is a designer behind it all. That's the teleological argument. It's the argument of design. And so look at this fork. Now, if you've never seen a fork, and you've never used one, just looking at it and picking it up and handling it, would you reasonably conclude that someone made it? He said, well, yeah, well, that's because you already know it's a fork. But if you've never had one, what would it, its characteristics tell you that it's a man-made tool? Well, you'd look at its metal. Metal doesn't naturally occur in, occur in this state. It has to be refined and, and you know, created by uh, much heat. 
And then we see that the, what do you call those things of the fork? Tines. Tines, I thought so. See, just make sure you're with me. You look at, there's four of them. They're parallel. They're all the same length. Now, could that be a coincidence? I guess so. But the curved handle and how it fits in your hand, and you can they come to a point, it'd be reasonable to conclude you don't find this laying on the ground. And if you found it on a path, you go, oh, look, it's someone lost their fork. Now, this is the argument of teleological reasoning. It's exhibiting or relating to design, especially in nature. Now, I'm going to show you something else. That when archaeologists dig it up, they go, design. And you might look at it and go, what? Now, that's a bone. But it is actually not a bone, but many, many, many thousands of years ago, it existed, and it's an owl. In other words, uh, where you make a hole in leather or material. Now, if you look at it, if I found it, I go, it's a bone. No, it's a tool fashioned by a human to, to make holes in material. And they look at the point that it comes to. They look at how it's been smooth, and it could have over many years of use and human oils on it. They come to a conclusion that's not just a bone. That bone was made by a man into a tool. Now, would you agree with that? Yeah. But there's not much element of design, is there? And now here's another one. That's a, um, uh, like a needle made out of a bone. You say, well, I'll give you on that one because it looks like a bone, but look at the fine point all the way around it. Obviously, someone fashioned that into a tool to use. Now, that's easier. Well, how about this one? What does that look like? Now, some of you are going down to Miller's. You walk along the, the Sandy Ann River, and there are these things all over. Now, you don't pick them up. Oh, look, someone made this. Someone used this. That's a pecking stone. They use it to chip at other things, material like obsidian to make arrows. And you look at it. What is it that tells you that someone used that? But to a trained eye, someone looks at the markings and goes, nope, we see these all over the world. They're pecking stones. They're tools. Like little hammers, ancient ones. Now, I say all this to share with you this argument of design is used all the time, especially when evaluating things in nature or things we uncover through archaeological digs. So it's fair to us to use the same argument when it comes to exploring the world around us and ask, does it point to a supreme designer, God himself? So that's what we're going to do. Because when you look at this, does anyone know what it is? Venus flytrap. Now, if you listen to an atheist who has a naturalistic answer for everything, that evolved over millions of years. Don't worry yourself with the idea that those finger-like things are sensitive. When there's two stimulations, it automatically closes on the fly that lands in it. Then it releases digestive enzymes. And it can take up several days. It'll digest that fly, and it's a carnivore plant. You say, well, boy, it looks like there's a lot of design there. And so that's why we're told to remember this statement by Richard Dawkins. That biology is the study of complicated things, here it is, that give the appearance of design. Oh, i got to stop there. Does he acknowledge when you look at a Venus flytrap or any other things of biology, they look like they've been designed? Does he acknowledge that? But he says, that's our job is to explain how it happened just naturally and randomly without God. It has the appearance of having been designed for a purpose, but I should have put up the other quote for him, but we know there is no purpose, and we really have no reason for living on this earth. Wow. Now, this, is this science, or is this a preconceived notion, and their eyes are closed to the evidence out there? Let's look at some of the evidence. William Paley is going to argue at this. He was a man that lived in the 1700s, and he was an apologetician. In other words, he gave defenses for Christianity and for the existence of God. This is a quote, and basically says, suppose you and I are walking down a path, 
And while we're on the path, I stumbled and hit my toe against a rock. And the question was asked, how did that rock get there? And I answered, he says, even though it's absurd, that rock's been there forever. Now, has any rock been there forever? He says, no, it had to come from somewhere, roll down off the hill, come out of a volcano. It may be pushed by a river because it's rounded. It just didn't exist there forever. But suppose I maintained that. Then we're walking along, and then I saw a watch. And I picked it up, and I remembered my answer to the first question. And when asked, where did this watch come from? He says, I give the same answer. It's been there forever. Then you'd look at the intricacies of it, that it has moving parts, it has form, and it has function. It has hands that move. And then by looking at it studied long enough, you can look and look at the sun. It tells time. Would you have to be, it's an incredible statement to say that it has been there forever, wouldn't you agree? Because of the appearance of design, you have to conclude reasonably there was a designer behind it. Now, is that reasonable? Now, remember, biology is a study of things that look like they've designed that really don't have one. Well, I don't know. That's not reasonable. If you can pick up a pecking stone and said someone used it, and I look at a watch and go, someone built that, what if I look at the intricacies of the nature around us, and is there a design? Uh, look at that. Designed or random? So the hurricane blew all over, and there was a... A uh, metal recycling yard, and after it was done, this uh, this thing was just all of a sudden there. You go, no, Jack, that's ridiculous. That's, see, that's Paley's argument. No, someone built that. So let's look at a, 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 some of your favorite animals. And some of you women won't like some of these things, but a bat. Every now and then, we've had bats in our houses. They come down the chimney. If you didn't have the screen shut, uh, they come in. Now, what do we know about bats? They're blind, right? Now, I've tried to catch that bat in our living room, and they have, they're so evasive so quickly. And so you get a tennis racket, and you try to play tennis with it, <laughs> and you just walk, and they're just... It's amazing. How do they... Now, if you turn on the lights, for we can see, does that matter if you turn the lights off? Can they still see? Because they use what's called sonar, correct? They emit sounds that you cannot hear, and we read that it's uh, uh, it, they're 2,000 times fainter than background noisy. No, they can detain, uh, detect their own signals that they emit that are 2,000 times fainter than background noises. And so they can, when the, the noise hits their prey, it bounces back to them, and they decode and hone in right on where that insect is, and they can snatch, it says, three to four uh, insects or five in a second. Now, military people have tested them. They put them through a chamber and emitted all sorts of noises try to confuse their radar, their sonar. Remember, they're sending out sound that you can't hear. Now, how do you evolve the ability to send out a sound? You know? <laughs> And then once it reflects off Marvin's head, it bounces back to me. How do you develop the ability to decode it? Because your eyes are closed. Marvin's there. Dave's there. How do you do that? I mean, there's no reason. You say, doesn't it look like it's been designed? The only reason person would say absolutely yes. And so they, uh, these, these sounds are 200 beeps per second. Remember they tried to jam, I was back on that story, they tried to jam the sonar of the uh, rat, rat, <laughs> they're flying rats, <laughs> and they couldn't jam it. It fly through this, this uh, place that they'd set up without any problems. And they concluded it's a billion times more sensitive, their sonar, than any radar or device created by man. So when you look at that, is there an element of design there? It's fair. Now, if it's just one the example, we'd have a problem. But we could do this all day long. So this is a baby's rattle. Now, babies love rattles because they make sound. Now, there's not much form or design required to make a rattle. 
Just a little piece of plastic and put some beans inside. But it can entertain a kid and parents for a long time. And it's amazing. I think the parents are more entertained than the child. Now, but is there an element of design there? If you picked up a rattle, like, obviously. So it's interesting. I told you the women would love this. Snakes. We went from bats to snakes, okay? Rattlesnakes are so cool. They really are. Yeah, they are. <laughs> And as long as you see them before they see you. Now, God has given them a system to alarm their predators or people that they're scared of, of that they exist. And what it is it? A rattle. How do you grow at the end of your tail, which you don't have, a rattle? How do you grow one? And for what purpose would you grow a rattle? And not only that, a baby, when it wets its diapers and pukes all over itself, what do the parents do to its clothes? changes them. Amazingly enough, a snake, when it's done with its skin, it's grown up uh, too big, it sheds its skin and even its teeth, its fangs, and grows new ones. Now, can you do that? No. Now, snakes get cooler than that because some are poisonous like a rattlesnake, and that's why you have to be uh, leery of them. There's two types of snakes when it comes down in the world. uh, There are snakes that have a neurotoxin and a hemotoxin. Now, this is science telling us this. Neurotoxin, when they bite you, the poison paralyzes you. It affects your nervous system. A hemotoxin, it poisons the blood. And so snakes do one or the other. Now, in sufficient amounts or close enough to the heart, it'll kill you, Right? Now, how do you develop, if you wanted to, fangs that would inject in someone else a neurotoxin? They said through millions of years, this natural chance, it just happened to create one. Well, okay, I'll give you one, but why would you create an alternate one that's a hemotoxin? Why two? They're totally different, but they do the same, at the end, the same result, they kill. You can't answer those questions. Does it seem to have an element of design? We have to say yes. Well, Jack, that's just three things. I think this is cool. People spend thousands of dollars for rugs that have been weaved, especially Tibetan ones, right? Now, when you look at a loom where they weave fabrics, they have all these strands of of thread coming, and they... They come together, and then they spend hours creating these beautiful designs, right? Now, if I said, <laughs> they just found one of those by chance, you know, you know, no, no, no. Even though the, it's simply made, the, that's just bamboo, you know there's design there, right? Especially the people use the tool because it not only has form, it has function or purpose. And that purpose is so they can take thread and make these beautiful uh, uh, woven materials out of. So we go, okay, where are you going with this? <clears throat> By chance? I mean, look at the symmetry. Look at the design. Now, we went from bats, flying rats, to snakes. See, I told you women love to spiders. A cherry Sue loves spiders. She comes to run, Jack, there's a spider in the building. Can you kill it for me? Okay. <laughs> JC's not here, so I'll be your hero, <laughs> okay? Now, but she has to appreciate them, don't you, Cherry Sue? I mean, why would you, how would you emit, and I don't even want to try to give a bodily example of how you would do it, but thread that comes out of your body? How, how would you do that? Why would you even think of it? And what would give you the ability to make beautiful geometric patterns like this? And not only are they beautiful, the thread that comes out, when you look at it, it's tensile strength. It's really strong for for the diameter of it. And there's a lot of it. Have you ever seen a a spider drop from the ceiling on his web all the way to the ground? Like, whoa, that's a lot. And so you look at it and you go, man, they're amazing. Do they have function? Because when something flies through it, they're sticky as well as just being strong. And they send vibrations to the, the uh, spider in the middle. And he goes out there and spreads or wraps up the victim who's caught in more of his, his web. And then he'll eat it for breakfast. Imagine that, Terry Sue. Okay. 
Now you look at that and you say, wow, was that designed or just happened by chance? Then when you look, that's actually a real web. You look at a diagram of them. They have a brain. They have a poison gland. Isn't that interesting? How do you develop a poison gland? They have what's called a sucking stomach. But here is the spinnerets where it emits all this web. How do you develop that? Now, if you looked at that and had a mechanical one like in a movie that you'd say, oh, that's great. They made a robot uh, spider. You know, they're making robot flies like little drones. If you saw a robot one, oh, isn't that amazing what man could do? But when we see a living one, oh, it just happened by chance. Is something missing in all this? Are we being reasonable just asking the question? Obviously, it's design. Now, let's talk about this. That's a rat trap or a mouse trap. See, we're getting rid of those pests that you don't like now. And to have one, everyone's trying to make the, the perfect mouse trap, right? There are some elements that you have to have in a mouse trap to make it function. Anything else is not necessary. You have to have a base to mount a spring on, because a spring is what makes it go whack, right? You have to have the hammer that goes whack, right? Then you have to have a catch that the, the mouse trips to make the hammer go whack, okay? And then you have to have the holding bar to keep it from going whack on your finger. All right, you with me? You need all of those. They have to be present, or will the mouse trap work? Say no. Now, could you put a picture of a mouse on the base? You know, just we're going to attract it, uh, another mouse by painting a picture of a mouse. Well, that might help. Is it necessary to make the mouse trap work? No. Could you make it a gold-plated uh, spring? To, well, you could, but is it necessary? No. We're just talking about the absolute necessary parts to make it work, and that's called irreducibly complex. In other words, you can't reduce this to any other simpler form. Do you with me? You have to have these parts. They all have to be working. They all have to be present at the same time in order for it to function. If you remove any of these parts away, will the rat tra mouse trap work? So it's irreducibly complex. You can't reduce it to any simpler form. That's interesting. When you look in science, through science eyes, at the world around us, you're going to see design where elements had to be irreducibly complex. In other words, every part had to be there at the same time for it to work. And you can't just evolve one part and then one part later because then you can't adapt. It all has to be there together or else it serves no purpose. And we'll give an example of that. Does this look like something that's been designed in an engineer's office? But that's actually a bacterial flagellum, and here's a picture of it. And when you have bacteria, it's actually a motorized uh, uh, biological thing that, that moves around in the uh, uh, bacteria, and it's like an outboard motor that actually moves inside the bacteria. And it has all these different parts that have to be necessary, a driving shaft, a bushing, a stator, a rotor, and this switch regulator. All these things are present, and they have identified it, and if everyone isn't there, it doesn't work. And this is just in bacteria. We haven't gotten to anything really big. Is there a little element of design there? Now remember, Francis Crick says, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed. Remember that? But rather evolved. Oh, really? Is there a pre-commitment to naturalism and Closing their mind to God. Even if the evidence leads you there, they will not look. Now, that's the difference between science and strong science that has a philosophy behind it. He was responsible for uh, discovering with James Watson the DNA, which we're going to look at in just a second. So let's go on. When you look at that, we have to consider a baby. To me, this is the most marvelous thing any time a baby's born, it's a, truly a miracle. When you say miracle, it happens billions of times every year. That's right. Well, maybe not every year, but it just happens billions of times. 
but yet all the things that have to happen for a child to be born, it just cries out for a designer, doesn't it? Every one of you started just like this, a single cell. Now, they can impregnate this cell in a laboratory now, but that happened just naturally for probably everyone here. Maybe there's an exception. But you started out as a single cell. As the mother and father came together, it took both of the mother and the father. 26 uh, chromosomes all together, 13 for the husband, 13 the wife. They have to be perfectly made it together, and they made a single cell that now starts to multiply. Now, remember, there's 75 to 100 trillion cells in your body right now. The best estimate is 100 trillion. You started as just one. Now, some of you became female, some of you became male, some of you became tall, some were short, some have different colored skin. We have eyes, we have ears, we have nose, we have a heart. One cell split and became all those different parts of your body. One cell. So as it starts splitting, it multiplies from one into two, and as it passes from, uh, in, down into the uterus, it gets up to about 16 cells. Now, 16 cells does not make a walking, talking baby, does it? And they all look the same at this time. But over the nine months of pregnancy, somehow, amazingly enough, that cell knows to make another cell and tells that cell, you go and start becoming a heart. You start becoming an eye. You start becoming legs and toes. And you start becoming... Every cell has its job, but at the beginning, they're all exactly what? The same. They all know what to do. Where did they get that information? And why does one become something other than the other? Well, that's what happens. There's 16 cells magnified on the tip of a safety pin. That's how you and I, all of us, started. That's how you became a living and breathing human being, a William. So you look at that, it took male and female, it took conception. That's an amazing thing itself. How do you explain why a man would have everything necessary and a woman have everything necessary to complement it and they come together and they form a new human life? How do you do How does that happen? Is there any design? Because without the male and his sperm and without the woman and his egg, there is no conception, is there? So then you have to bring them both together. And the whole process is amazing how it happens. And it happens over and over and over. And it starts with one cell. They divide to every part of the body. And then finally there's birth. And when there's birth, that baby would die. Except amazingly enough, the mother has a built-in feeding system. And it had to grow on its own without a baby being around. So you're not adapting, are you, to your environment? You're growing it ahead of time. It had to be there or else the baby dies because it has to have its mother's milk. How do you grow a breast? But yet that one cell, one of them said, I'm going to become one. And it produced milk, and that milk comes at the right time to supply everything that baby needs. That's what's going on right now. (laughs) To give it all the nutrition it needs. And then when it's done, the milk stops. Is there any bit of design in all this process that you could maybe point to? You say, well, how did all that happen? Right here. This is DNA. This is talking about DNA. That's, there's DNA in every simple cell in the nucleus. Now, there's no such thing as this simple cell. I used to think in science class, it's a, like a fried egg. There's this egg, and there's a yolk in the middle. That's a cell. No. Every cell is like a city in itself. All the processes are going on. It's just so fascinating. We're just going to look at one thing, the information stored in every one of your 100 trillion cells in your body. It's called DNA. And we talk about it. Here, Anthony Flew says this. Remember, I have his book. He was one of the most self-proclaimed atheists that argued and debated uh, believers, there is no God, he became a believer and wrote this book. It's, it's called uh, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. Here's his quote. Yes, it says, The investigation of DNA has shown by the most unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life 
that intelligence must have been involved. Well, what are we talking about? Because when you look at it, a human cell contains enough information to fill a million pages of an encyclopedia. One human cell. Uh, the 46, I said 13, 13, so it's be 23 and 23, all right? 23 and 23 come together and make conception. So every cell has 46 uh, chromosomes, all right? They're about two meters long. There's three billion units. And in this is all the information in a cell for some one cell to become a heart, another cell to become a brain, another cell to become an arm or a toenail, whatever. All that information's in there. And we look at it. There's 300 billion pairs. If you put it on a thumb drive, it would be about 750 megabytes. All right? That's a lot of information. Now, one gram of DNA can store 700 terabytes of data. How do you get this much information in a microscopic cell that you cannot see with your human eye? Remember the first computers? They'd fill up this whole room. They could even store a megabyte of information, some of them, when they started. But we're talking about nearly a gigabyte. One gram would be 700 terabytes of information packed microscopically. And if you could do that and make it a living organism, you would be rich, rich, rich if you could patent it. But that's what exists in every one of you. So when a cell dies, another re re replicates itself and becomes a new one in place of one that died. Your heart regenerates itself, what they say, every six months. The cell's in it. It's amazing what happens. Now, there's 100 trillion cells that contain all this information. So the question is, how did that information get in the cell? How did each cell know? Everyone knows their job, and they have an encyclopedia. I could become a heart, an eyeball, or whatever, and they know what it takes to become all those. They have all that information encoded in them. We can't figure out any of it. Well, it reeks of divine design. Here he says, I now believe there is a God. I think the evidence points to creative intelligence almost entirely because of DNA investigations. He says, it's just too overwhelming. You can't get knowledge, information by chance. And he says, what I think DNA material has done that is shown by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life, that intelligent must have been involved in getting these extraordinary diverse elements to work together. A former atheist who ridiculed believers now says, nope, the evidence is in. There has to be intelligence behind it. Here's the camera I use. Well, it's the new model, hint, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> It's a Canon 7D. This is the Mark II, all right? And they increase the, uh, the, the, how fast it can shoot. I think it's like six frames per second. It has an articulating screen now, and it uh, captures video. But there's a complaint. It doesn't have 4K video now, because all now your TVs can display 4K video. So now they want 4K cameras. They say, why don't you have one? And also they want dual memory slots rather than just one. And so when you look at it and you look at this, and there's just the motor drive that how it makes it shoot so fast, obviously design, right? Obvious. And then we look at that baby's eye, which one cell decided, I'm going to go up there become an eye. And when you look at that cell, there's two million working parts. Two million. This is science telling us. I'm not, it's, not, it's all their, their information. It's the second most complex organ to the brain. Second. It can handle 500,000 messages simultaneously. 80% of your memories are detected by the eye. It focuses instantly, and it can process 50 things per second. And not only that, it sees in 3D, 4,000K, and they record it all in your brain. And even a blind person, if they weren't blind when they were young, they can recall those images in their dreams. And vivid color, it's all stored there. How does it do that? And this eye, it starts to develop two weeks after conception. One little cell says, I'm going to be an eye. So good for you. All right, he goes up there, and he can differentiate the eye between 10 million colors, but only can see three. Red, blue green. And every other color is a combination of those. But it can make a difference between 10 million and it can see a galaxy 2.6 million light years away. 
Now, which is more complex, that or my camera? It's interesting. It has 100 million nerves that have to connect simultaneously with 100 nerves, endings at the back of your brain to take all that information. The, 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 the picture comes in upside down and sideways. It has to invert it. And uh, it has to add the color and the detail. It has to decode it uh, as far as depth and all that because there's two eyes. I don't know why you have two. It should just be one. Why'd you grow two? And then it has, takes all that information, records it, makes sense of it so you can see. And if all those 100 million nerve endings don't line up, you have nothing. And we could go on. I just don't have the time. Here's a picture of some of those nerves that are connected from your eye to the back of your brain. Now, here's what Darwin said. Remember, he's the father of evolution. To suppose the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different justice, for emitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection. He's saying, this eye, to think that it evolved, I freely confess, sounds absurd in the highest sense. This was his big stumbling block. He says, I don't know how you develop an eye without intelligence behind it. And we're not done there. Here is evolutionist Robert Jasper. He worked for uh, NASA and a very brilliant man. They said no one wrote science books that you could understand like him. Here's what he said. The eye appears to have been designed. Remember what biology is? It's the study of things that appear to have been designed for a purpose. And when science is honest with you, they'll say that's exactly how the eye looks, as well as a lot of other things. No designer of telescopes could have done better. How could this marvelous instrument have evolved by chance through a succession of random events? And the answer is what? I don't think it's reasonable to say that it could. Now, uh, here he says there's no direct proof that evolution could work these miracles. In other words, they have no explanation how the eye developed. It is hard to accept the evolution of the eye as a product of chance. Well, good for you. And I'm glad to say he, from agnostic, became a believer based on the observations that he had made about the world around him. And that's what God said. I did not leave you without witness. Just look at the creation around you. and You're without excuse. You can know I'm there. And he came to that conclusion. Astronomers now have painted themselves in the corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in the cosmos on the earth. And they found that all this happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to discover because it's God that there are what I or anyone could call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. Wow. What evidence else do we need when people know much more than a you or I comes to this conclusion just by looking at the world around us? So when we're all said and done, God said this from the beginning, didn't he? When we look at some of the statements, the psalmist said, For the wicked boast of his heart's desire, Psalms chapter 3, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. The wicked and the haughty of his countenance does not seek him, and all his thoughts are, there's no God. It's truly, that's many people around us today, and we have to choose to listen to them no longer. Because the evidence is in, it's always been there, there is a God. And design proves it. And that's what the psalmist writes himself when he says, For thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. (laughs) Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. I'm going to ask you this. Don't be ashamed anymore to stand up and say, there is a God. Don't be ashamed anymore of his gospel, which is his power to save. Be proud to say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made by my God. And when people ask you, where's your evidence? Just look at yourself. How did you get here? 
it, the evidence is in, the verdict has been said, there is a God. A couple other verses that we'll save for next week, but I just want you to be confident. We stand on solid ground. You can know assuredly there is a designer. We're not here by chance. We just didn't happen to be. And really, it's only the fool that says in his heart there is no God. And so don't view people with malintent or with evilness. Just feel, if anything, sorry for those who have closed their minds to the reality of God. Others who are questioning, point them to the evidence. Talk with them reasonably. Ask them the tough questions. How did we get here? How come there's obviously elements of design? What does that point to? Be proud of our Lord, and you'll have a firm foundation because you can know assuredly there is a God. If you're with us and you know that I need to act on that information, i got to become a child of God, and you know what you need to do, or if you don't, just let your desires be known, and we'll help you, we'll study with you, whatever it takes as we stand and sing just the first verse of this song.